the launch of a new coal mine in Australia has divided the country. No more coal! No more coal! We have to take stronger action, civil disobedience. They are over here pleading with our governments not to build new coal mines. We have a responsibility to them. An energy giant seeks to generate electricity in India and create jobs across Australia. The opportunity is to feed the very, very best coal to those plants. We have an industry to be super proud of. Adani is a revolution for us in central Queensland because it's going to give up job opportunities. But some fear the impact on Australia's natural resources. Our own government is destroying the Great Barrier Reef. We've lost about half of all the corals of the Great Barrier Reef. With communities bracing for impact in their neighbourhoods. Yeah, that's a water bomber. He's going back to the airport to refuel because there's a fire still going over the back there. In 30 years, when we've got raging bushfires, our water's running out, we can't grow crops anymore. Can the Australian government fight the realities of climate change? We're getting more cyclones, we're getting uh, monsoonal events, and climate change is a big issue. Queensland, Australia. Suburbs in the southeastern tip of the country are engulfed in bushfires. Catastrophic hot, drought like conditions with wind speeds of 90 miles an hour. The fires spread fast. People are evacuated to safety, while more than 20 homes are burnt to ashes. Rescue services use aerial bombers to douse the fires, now spread over 4,200 acres. An emergency is declared in vast swathes of Queensland. In May 2019, 65% of Queensland was declared to be in drought. Water supplies for farms and homes are running dry. We travelled to Stanthorpe, a suburban town two hours from Brisbane, to investigate the impact of this heat wave. Behind a number of homes uh, in those two locations, the Pingowry and, and Woolaway. That's James Morris from the New South Wales Rural Fire Service giving us the latest update on those three. The severity of dwindling water supplies can be gauged by the signboards that welcome us. As we arrive, firefighters leave to douse raging fires nearby. Stantop's community meeting is called. Local police and the mayor have urgent announcements. Exclusion zones, and I can't stress enough, they are exclusion zones for safety reasons. We've got trees that have been burnt out in those dry root systems that could easily fall over on cars. There's power lines down. You can see the direction the wind was going and it with speed and with um, ferocious flames. The residents are holed up inside the center, unsure if their homes have survived the blaze. While outside, water bombing continues. As fires briefly subside, 
70-year-old Kerry Stratford is allowed back into her home. This was all a light on Friday night. I watched all this burn. And that house that's up the top there is called the Eagle's Nest. And I'm surprised the Eagle Nest escaped because that was just burning. They had to call the fireys back there yesterday to put some stuff out. But it got up to there, it stopped there. So there must have been a heap of fireys here. See that brown thing behind those rocks? That's melted, there's a little car. That's a water tank. It's melted. The top of it's melting, there's water in it. That's how, that's how hot the fire was. Kerry's home miraculously survived. The fire stopped a few metres from where she lives. When you're faced with not having a home to come back with, and that's the thing, that's still getting to me, how lucky I am that my home survived. I've got my late husband's voice on that. That's the only thing I've got of hearing him talk. And that was when it snowed here on the 17th of August, 2015. That's when it snowed. They evacuated those people out of there. The hardest thing is when you get the knock on the door. You know it's coming from the police saying, get out. And I said, oh, yeah, I'll get, I've, I've got everything packed, everything ready. And he said, well, make sure you go. Stantop's remaining water supply is being sacrificed for firefighting. Well, the fact that we've been in drought up here for so long, we haven't had decent rain for a oh, good two years now. Um, we've had spasmodic rain. Our dam, if you go just have a look at Stone King Dam, um, that'll shock you because that's really shocking out there. We're on water, severe water restrictions. We'll be out of water at the town here by December. And I don't know if they're using the water from our dam out there to fill the fire bombers for this. I don't know where they're getting the water from. The fires have shattered livelihoods, animal habitats, water supplies, and agriculture. According to the Climate Council of Australia, economic loss due to reduced agricultural productivity is projected to exceed $19 billion by 2030, $211 billion by 2050, and $4 trillion by 2100. Reusing water has now become the only way to survive the drought in many parts of the country. Still my bath water's in there, because I saved that. Right, and then I use my bucket that I've got there. In my washing machine, I'll have to give that a rinse out. There's, there's all ash inside there from the fire, from the ash that come through. So I bucket it with that bucket in there, wash my clothes in it, hang it out, then put it out into the bucket, and then it goes on what plants I've got to keep alive. That's the only way you water a plant. You're not allowed to outside water your plants. There's no doubt the climate is evolving. It is changing. But I know that we're getting a few degrees warmer each year. You know, we've, we've noticed a big increase in the, in, in the global warming. But I don't know how you stop that. Um, there's something definitely happening with the Earth. The State of the Climate 2018 report for Australia reveals a land surface temperature increase of one degree Celsius. That's led to hot, dry conditions perfect for bushfires. The science was saying then that if we keep putting carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, the temperature will steadily increase. There will be more frequent extremes, more very hot days. There'll be changes to rainfall patterns. So the science was saying 30 years ago that Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, the southern cities of Australia would get drier, and that's all happened. Already, Australia is ranked the seventh highest carbon emitter per capita. One big reason, coal-fired power plants. Coal provides fuel for about 70% of electricity production in Australia. A majority of these plants are located in the state of Queensland. The state has a historical relationship with coal. Mining began here in the 18th century. Behind most coal mining operations lay years of struggle and toil. This coal earned royalties for the Queensland government and sparked development across the country. But today, 
the region is a shadow of its past, with coal jobs lost to automation. Still, coal production continues to grow to feed a hungry market abroad. Now, instead of reducing Australia's carbon footprint, the Queensland Premier has promised to open new coal mines in her state. It's part of Anastasia Palaszczuk's plan to create thousands of new jobs. But at what price? Australia is the world's largest exporter of coal, a commodity that's aided the rise in temperatures worldwide. Coal-fired electricity generation accounted for 30% of global CO2 emissions, according to the International Energy Agency, resulting in record temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius in Australia, leaving the residents of Stanthorpe desperate for water. As rescue services scrambled to save lives, Queensland's Premier calls for an emergency press conference. So we have uh, a number of families at the moment that are actually going through um, some really traumatic times. So we are in the process of trying to reach those families. We understand that they're all safe, but they will be going through um, a lot of grief at the moment, and I know that our community will pull together and uh, definitely make sure that they get back on their feet. Uh, we're, we're filming a documentary from Singapore, from Channel News Asia. Just wanted to get a comment from you about uh, the increasing number of coal mines resulting in rising temperatures. Do you feel that they, this is a direct impact of that? Well, we do know that climate change has a big impact. We knew that um, from the, we're getting more cyclones, we're getting uh, monsoonal events. And climate change is a big issue that everyone signs up to in terms of keeping with the Paris Treaty. But the latest addition to Queensland's coal industry has incensed thousands of anti-coal protesters across the country. No coal! No coal! After the break, we investigate the politics of coal in Australia. Two-thirds of extreme weather events in the last 20 years were caused by human activities. The Paris Agreement signed in 2016 aimed to curb emissions to minimize temperature rise by 1.5 degrees. If current trends continue, the world is likely to pass the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark between 2030 and 2052, unless it finds a way to reach net zero emissions. Amid this alarming situation, the state of Queensland announced new coal mines to boost the economy and create jobs. That's when Indian billionaire Gautam Adani announced plans to build a mine at Carmichael, a rural outpost in the Australian outback. At the time, Carmichael was to excavate 60 million tonnes of coal a year. That figure has since been scaled down. In effect, what we're building now is a 10 million tonne per annum coal mine. We're just one of 125 operating coal mines in Australia. We'll be building 200 kilometres of greenfield rail construction to tie into the existing network. So combined, that will represent around a $2 billion Australian investment uh, to be able to get us into production, and we'll see that coming online in 2021. The mine would be located on the Galilee Basin, 160 kilometres northwest of Clermont. It will also feature a rail line connecting the mine to the Abbott Point Terminal. The opening of the Carmichael mine is expected to attract more investments in the mining sector, which activists say would increase greenhouse emissions that trap heat and make the planet warmer. Roughly 30% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions came from electricity production from coal and gas in 2018. Australia's mining sector once the backbone of the economy is in a long, protracted slump. 
I think a lot more businesses are going to close, which a lot have already closed, haven't they? Yeah. Like, they've had to close the doors because of, the, there's no people in the town. People have to move away because there is nothing here, you know? Um, so, the younger generation has got no future. Yeah, that's right. The younger generation of Bowen, they've got nothing. What Bowen, do they turn to? Well, look around. I mean, the town's dead. Completely. Completely dead. And uh, the town needs employment real bad. There's nothing here for the younger generation. They all leave town. Adani announced thousands of jobs to be created over the next few years. A prospect much welcomed by the mining community. The pro Adani movement was centred around jobs, uh, jobs for the community. Um, Claremont's a very strong mining town. I think it was founded uh, on copper mining back in the 1800s and obviously then gold. And the people of Claremont following the investment and in town um, and the ability for those people to gain jobs um, was very pro Adani, I think. I, I believe that mining's important. I, I don't think that it's sustainable to think that we can go straight from coal-fired power to natural resources like wind or solar. But I think they should work hand in hand. A number of people locally uh, work in the mining industry, so uh, a lot of them are, are quite keen, I believe, to get more jobs going um, in that area. Unemployment here hovers above 9% compared to around 6% in Queensland as a whole. That's why Bruce Hedditch is busy promoting the Adani mine. He started the Go Adani campaign. It's going to generate a lot of job opportunities for central Queensland. The Queensland government last year received $3.8 billion in coal royalties from, from, uh, from uh, coal mines throughout this state. $3.8 billion. Uh, next year, the Queensland Government will spend $3.9 billion on interest on loans. Now, the opponents of Adani and coal are asking us, as a community, to stop coal exports, stop the royalties coming through. I would love someone to tell me where the $3.8 billion is going to come from. For a town devoid of jobs, it's a polarising question of unemployment versus the environment. There are questions about whether or not the mine will pay appropriate royalties or any royalties to our state government and uh, huge concerns about the fact that there won't be that many jobs provided and that the company has effectively massively exaggerating, uh, exaggerated the jobs that they say it would, it would provide. Adani's initial promise of thousands of new jobs was challenged by a court testimony. An affidavit alleged that Adani Mining's billion-dollar Carmichael coal project would have 483 full-time equivalent jobs, while Queensland as a whole would have 1,206 full-time equivalent jobs. We'll see over 1,500 uh, direct jobs created during the ramp-up and construction for the mine and rail and a further 6,750 indirect jobs. So in total, what we're talking about is 8,250 jobs invest in, injected into the Australian economy, in particular in regional Queensland, and, and specifically in areas that have typically got high levels of unemployment. And we're talking about areas that have approached close to 10% levels of unemployment. So the project's certainly very important for Australia and for Queensland and regional Queensland as it relates to jobs. Jobs aside, TV journalist Mark Willisey has news that's far less hopeful. He tracked developments on Adani mining elsewhere. The company was charged in Zambia with polluting a major river and convicted. Um, under Australian law, if you um, have any convictions or issues involving mining and you're in charge, you have to declare that. That was not declared by this particular Adani executive at the time. And that culminated recently with Adani being charged and it's going to be prosecuted for supplying false and misleading information to the state government here in Queensland. The state of Queensland imposed hundreds of environmental conditions for the Carmichael mine to adhere to. Particular attention was paid to Adani's surface water use 
and the mine's proximity to the Great Artesian Basin. The Great Artesian Basin is the biggest underwater resource in the world, stretching over 1.7 million square kilometers. It is 3,000 meters deep in places and is estimated to contain 65,000 cubic kilometers of groundwater. The basin provides the only source of fresh water to much of inland Australia. Underground coal mines rely on water to reduce the risk of fires or explosions by using it to cool the cutting surfaces of mining equipment and prevent coal dust from catching fire. So we know about water being very precious. The Adani mine would um, suck up as much water as the rest of the users in the whole catchment and they don't have to pay as much for it because our state laws are very lax and give a whole lot of freebies to mining companies for reasons that we can go into later, mostly because they make generous donations to both sides of politics. We will not be extracting water from the Great Artesian Basin. We don't have any plans, we don't have any authorities, or we don't have any approvals to extract water from the Great Artesian Basin. There are instances where we'll have to extract groundwater simply to be able to allow mining to be undertaken safely. So it's simply for safety reasons, not for water extraction reasons. And outside of that, all of our water will be sourced uh, from surface sources. Tom Collins, a former Queensland water chief, estimates the mine may tap on a substantial amount of the state's water resources. When Adani starts to extract coal and uh, intercepts the Great Artesian Basin aquifers, water will flow out of those aquifers into the mine pits and Adani are allowed to extract unlimited volumes of water out of those mine pits to keep their mining operations safe. Adani there, the modelled uh, extraction of water over the life of the mine is 270 gigalitres. That is equivalent to around about 55% of Sydney Harbour. Animal grazers like Bruce Curry rely on the Great Artesian Basin for their water supplies. He lives in Speculation, a rural outpost in the Australian outback. People can't exist without water. If you want to know what I'm talking about, turn your water supply off for two days and try and survive, regardless of where you are, because what's happening here, they're turning our water off for perpetuity. When they destroy it, it's gone forever. Along with wife Annette, the Curries have been running this farmland for generations. This is the coal seam they, they want to dig out. It's the D coal seam. This is where we draw our water from, which is the clematis sandstone, and that is part of the feed into the Great Artesian Basin. The only thing is, once they, they mine that coal seam out, they have a process called long wall mining. And what it does is, once the coal comes out, they just collapse all the strata above it. So what that'll do, it'll drain that clematis sandstone. So basically, it'll destroy our water supply and it'll destroy part of the feed into the Great Artesian Basin and uh, which will impact on the integrity of the Great Artesian Basin. Bruce's worries about destroyed water supplies inspired him to go on a fact-finding walkabout overseas. He wanted to see what the future of speculation might look like way out in India. I went to India a few years ago to actually have a look at the uh, Adani operation and to talk to, my main concern was to talk to communities and farmers over in that area and um, get a, a good understanding of the company that would be coming. When I was in India, we went to uh, the Adani Special Economic Zone up there in the Gulf of Kutch and I spoke to fishermen there and they highlighted to me there the pressures and the, the uh, impacts that they're suffering because the Tatars as well as the Adanis have built a power station there. They actually release their hot water out into the ocean and which kills the um, juvenile fish, fish eggs, and has a, a big impact on the, the fishing communities that are trying to survive on that source of income. They're also not doing anything about the fly ash that's coming out of their smoke, their, the stacks of the power station, and that fly ash is going across farmers' lands. 
Bruce is unsure if similar damage to the Great Artesian Basin is reversible. Once the mine starts and the dewatering starts, uh, whether that their findings are accurate or not, they cannot repair the damage. And the water is mined forever. It's lost for perpetuity. Regardless of how big their mistake is, they cannot rectify it. They cannot correct it, and the impacts is there for perpetuity. As the climate gets hotter and drier, water is even more precious. Farmers like Bruce want their groundwater to be protected from any damage. It is a shame that more people aren't aware of what the Great Artesian Basin is all about. It's, you know, one of the biggest freshwater, underground freshwater sources in the world. And it's not polluted, it's not contaminated. It's environmental terrorism. But the money we've made and the life we've lived on spec, and to think that they could just, through the flick of a pen, take that away from us. It's not fair and it's not right. Like when you went to India to have a look at those poor farms over there, I don't begin to understand how that has affected their family. What will we do? After a prolonged legal battle, the Adani Carmichael mine has received the environmental clearances it needs. But the opposition to its construction continues. After the break, we go underwater to investigate the impact of rising greenhouse gases on the Great Barrier Reef. Well, there's parts of the Great Barrier Reef where you can uh, drive in a boat or, or swim for kilometers without seeing a living coral. Indian energy giant Adani wants to mine Australian coal, planning to export it back to India. Adani is the largest private thermal power producer in India, with an installed capacity of more than 12,000 megawatts. But they're ramping up production in India. Adani stands to gain from the rising need for power in developing South Asia. To fill the gap in supply, it's looking at Australian coal. Clear coal we shipped through uh, Abbott Point port operations. It's been operating for over 35 years in an environmentally responsible way. There's thousands of ship movements through the Great Barrier Reef every year. So you know, the, the prospect that our, the shipment of our coal through the Great Barrier Reef is going to have a di direct impact on the reef is just a falsehood. To export this coal, Adani signed a 99-year lease with Abbott Point Terminal in 2011. The deal cost Adani roughly two billion Australian dollars. A few years back, there was a plan for massive expansion of ports in the Great Barrier Reef, and there's basically six big ports already. And there was a hope by industry, um, with their hand being held by government, to expand those ports to ship more coal out and more liquefied natural gas out through the Great Barrier Reef to world export markets. Now, the problem with making ports uh, bigger and deeper is that it requires a huge amount of dredging. So the huge impacts from that dredging were um, a very, very big concern to marine scientists. The developments surrounding Abbott Point Port are being keenly watched by coral expert Charlie Verin. That's because of Abbott Point's close proximity to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest coral reef system, composed of over 2,900 individual reefs, large enough that it can be seen from outer space. This is the world's biggest single structure made by living organisms. Reefs occupy just 1% of the world's marine environment, but they provide a home to a quarter of all marine species, including unique fish, turtles, and algae. A large part of the reef is protected by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, which helps to limit the impact of human use 
such as fishing and tourism. The reef has lost more than half its coral cover since 1985. High temperatures cause mass coral bleaching due to warm ocean waters. A coral reef is a very competitive environment. Everything competes with everything else all the time. So corals have got this symbiosis with the algae and that produces food and oxygen. But if you raise the temperature just above the absolute temperature tolerance that the corals have, the algae produce too much oxygen and that kills them. We head out to investigate the effects of rising temperatures on the Great Barrier Reef. Charlie Verin is out to collect evidence. He's hoping the remaining reef might be spared from rising temperatures. Well, there's parts of the Great Barrier Reef where you can uh, drive on a boat or, or swim for kilometres without seeing a living coral. So the worst affected is total death of the whole reef. And we see that in a few reefs, uh, but the majority of reefs of the Great Barrier Reef have not been wiped out by any means, but they have been quite severely damaged. Reefs protect coastlines from flooding during extreme storms, which is why saving corals is critical. As the seas warm, and they're warming gradually every year, the, the increase that threatens corals warms incrementally just each year. It gets more and more threatening. And whether that kills the coral or not depends on the amount of time it is exposed to these maximum conditions, maximum temperature conditions. That varies in patches all over the ocean surface, and it, but it is increasing year by year, and that will continue. Charlie is now retired, but has spent his life raising awareness of coral bleaching. The other is um, direct lying, direct telling of lies by politicians. When, for example, um, uh, politicians say that Australia is meeting all its obligations under the Kyoto, under Paris Agreement, um, Australia is going absolutely nowhere near meeting its obligations. Now, it is not possible for a politician to, to not know the truth because scientists know the truth. Scientists tell the politicians. It's all in publications of all different levels. So if you want to say we are meeting our obligations under all these uh, treaties that have happened, um, you are not telling the truth. And again, that's political. A report card by the government's Australian Institute of Marine Science wasn't encouraging. Rising water temperatures are likely to cause more coral bleaching, producing irreversible damage to the reef. Scientists expect the coral may recover over the next five to 10 years, but only if another mass bleaching event doesn't occur during that time. That's unlikely given the current trajectory of climate change. In 2015, Australia Institute put the Carmichael Mine's expected emissions over the next 30 years into perspective. It believes the annual carbon emissions of this single coal mine would be three times the average annual emissions from New Delhi, double those from Tokyo, six times that of Amsterdam, and 20% more than New York City if the mine produces 40 megatons per year. Adding more carbon dioxide from mines can potentially threaten thousands of animal species that rely on the reef, not to mention the $6.4 billion in tourism revenue and 64,000 full-time jobs the Great Barrier Reef provides to Australia. Tourism operator Lindsay Simpson is concerned about her livelihood. Her boat tours serve international tourists on a daily basis. If we add more mines to that, we are looking at a reef that's already under terrible threat 
We're looking at 70,000 people earning their money from tourism who won't have anywhere to take anyone to look at. And I mean, I've had laughingly heard people say there's something called disaster tourism. In India, he was going to give all these jobs to locals. He then imported workers from Orissa and all these other places. He did not give the locals jobs. He did for the first year, and there is evidence he's giving work now. That work is not going to be there. And if you look at in terms of long-term work, 1,300 workers is what he was talking about versus 70,000 in tourism. And those workers are only going to be fly in, fly out. The coal mine has also sparked the native title movement. Every mining project in this country, it tends to be out in um, remote country. And a lot of that country is traditional Aboriginal country. And under Australian law, um, Aboriginal people from those areas can claim what they call native title. And that's a form of guardianship over these lands. Now, no one has taken guardianship over that land, but there is an Aboriginal group there that wants to do that and they can legitimately apply to the courts to do that. As a leader of the Wangan and Jagalingu native people who own this land, Adrian Baragaba took Adani to court. According to him, the Carmichael coal mine can harm around 30,000 hectares of his community's traditional lands. Eventually, the court ruled in favor of Adani Australia, who are now seeking $600,000 in court costs, which would bankrupt Baragaba. Adrian and his clan have now been barred from entering their own lands. This always was Aboriginal land. This always was First Nations sovereign land because of our culture and how we maintain our culture. And we're not going anywhere. It's always going to be Aboriginal land. It's always going to be our land. And if they, can, if they, want, to, if they want to come out here and try to move us and move our sacred site, then uh, they will be criticised. This country will be scrutinised over their treatment of Aboriginal people. The Wangan Jagalingu people will no longer stand for this bullying tactic from Adani or from any government in this country. But Adrian's resistance sparked a people's movement across Australia, the Stop Adani movement. They are over here pleading with our governments not to build new coal mines. We have a responsibility to them and to our children to have a safe future for them to live in. The opposition to Adani's Carmichael mine has sparked a grassroots environmental movement across Australia. A loose group of environmental activists, students and common folk coming together to pressurise Adani to stop the mine. Some of them have gathered at Camp Binby. It's called the Stop Adani Movement. We've been given exclusive access to the camp after much deliberation and background checks. <laughs> 23-year-old Amy Booth used to live in Victoria, but decided to join the Stop Adani Movement in the Australian outback. People are gonna be displaced by the climate crisis, so I felt that me working um, in the city, taking, sort of doing business as usual, working nine to five, just isn't where I want to be right now. We have a moral obligation to, to act and to stop this mine and to stop other environmental problems going ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to put my life on hold for the moment to do what I can to stop projects like this from going ahead because this isn't just about 
this particular area. Every project that is a fossil fuel project is adding to CO2 in the atmosphere and that affects the entire globe. Protesters like Amy believe that if built, Odani's Carmichael mine will add billions of tons of carbon pollution to our atmosphere. In that context, it is criminally irresponsible to be proposing the opening of new coal mines or new coal-fired power stations. And the Adani case is a particularly important one because that would not just be a significant coal mine in itself, it would potentially open up the whole Galilee Basin as a new coal province. And there are five or six other possible coal mines in the pipeline that would be more likely to go ahead if Adani started because the infrastructure for getting the coal to port, uh, for managing water and energy and infrastructure would be there and that would reduce the start-up costs of other coal mines. And that's why Adani has become a really symbolic issue in Australia. These anti-coal activists are now taking a more hands-on position by physically blocking coal trains, mines and machines. A strategy now commonly known as a lockdown. On 22nd July 2019, protesters set up a blockade outside the Abbott Point port. About 20 members of the environmental group gathered outside the port entrance at 7 a.m. This footage was filmed by Amy as her co-protesters, 22-year-old Emily Starr and 20-year-old Matilda Hesselin, locked themselves to a concrete barrel. We wanted to start acting to show that we weren't going to let we weren't going to sit by and let this just happen. Um, so we locked on in terms of we had our arms clipped onto this um, little bar inside a barrel that was filled with cement and then there was a PVC tube that our arms would go down and be clipped onto. They stopped the supply of coal for hours. That's when the Queensland police stepped in. As tension mounted, a French television crew filmed the action from the side. I was willing to be arrested, which I was, because a short-term inconvenience of being arrested and being given a fine is OK with me because the long-term benefit of stopping this mine from going ahead will be amazing. Amy continued filming events that day. The journalists and activists are detained and charged with trespassing on the railway line. The French crew were later released after global condemnation grew, but they've since been barred from filming anywhere close to the mine. They were embarrassed. They think that that was a mistake, what the officers did up there, and I know from the police commissioner down, that was why the, the charges were dropped. So it was some overzealous police, policing by those police officers are up, up there. Emily and Matilda are now facing a court hearing at Bowen, uncertain if they'll be allowed back into Camp Binby. We're hoping that no curveballs will be thrown when we get in there, but it'll likely just be sort of, well, we're hoping it'll be a fine with no like restitution order against us, but we're not sure what it will be really. Magistrates can do whatever they like. After an hour, they come out of the court. I felt like he understood our passion as well, which I think was really important. I really liked hearing that he did understand that. Even if he didn't necessarily agree with it. Yeah, yeah. I think that in Australia we have a huge problem and in many places around the world we have a huge problem where the political systems are broken and that's why we've come to do these kind of actions because we feel like these are the only sort of things that can put enough pressure on political systems to fundamentally change rather than just sort of put a band-aid on the issue. 
We're at a critical point in history. There's no doubt that in ecological terms, we're booked on the Titanic. We're heading for the iceberg. And there are still irresponsible people, both literally and metaphorically, throwing coal in the boilers as if they wanted to get there faster. Coal particulates pollution is estimated to shorten some one million lives annually worldwide. One study even estimates premature deaths arising from coal-related air pollution could be as high as 52,000 people worldwide. But with solar and wind power slowly creeping up, there's been positive change. Coal's use has been on the decline in Europe and the US amid cheaper alternatives. Adani Australia is promoting solar power as a means to bridge the gap between coal emissions and the global push towards renewable energy. Rugby Run, which has an initial capacity of 65 megawatts, is located near Moranbar. It's not a question of renewables or coal, it's renewables and coal. And so from our perspective, we've already, we've got under over 2,385 megawatts under, uh, under operation uh, in relation to solar and we've got another 2,340 megawatts currently under construction of solar capacity. So in short, uh, you know, we've got uh, in excess of 4,700 megawatts of renewables capacity in our portfolio. That's a mixture of, of solar, principally solar, but we've also got hybrid in there as well, including wind. So we see that uh, moving forward, in order to meet the developing world's energy demand requirements, it's going to continue to require underpinning baseload coal-fired power generation, in addition to renewables through the likes of solar, wind, um, hydro and so forth. Many believe the solution to Australia's coal dependence has to come from within the political sphere. The Australian Greens run on four core values. Ecological sustainability, social justice, grassroots democracy and peace and non-violence. We were just sitting in Parliament and the best thing about that whole experience was that we could hear you more than we could hear them. Which is frankly what Parliament should be about. It should be about the people's voice The Greens have a plan to phase out coal and create a jobs boom in the renewable energy export industry. <laughs> we have great economic potential in clean energy here in Queensland, in Australia, globally. We know that there's more jobs in renewables. We know that uh, renewable energy can do the job. We've now got the battery storage, the solar thermal, the ways of making clean energy at 24-7 and dispatchable. There is no reason to not go down that path and actually safeguard humanity. Australia's current bushfire season has taken 12 lives destroyed millions of hectares of land and wiped out nearly 500 million animals with no signs of rains or temperatures subsiding. Stopping global warming will require coordinated policies by national, state and local governments. And the development of climate-friendly energy policies that are backed by politicians and activists alike. Before time runs out, and the irreversible effects of climate change impact the very existence of humankind. <laughs>